Hello and welcome to the Alatia Foundation podcast. My name is Mari Beveridge. Today we are joined by Professor Graham Wheel. Professor Wheel is a professor of energy economics at Ruhr University in Bochum in Germany. He is a recognized expert on energy markets, energy strategy, and the energy transition in the European Union and the United States. He has a comprehensive knowledge of the interconnection between technological, economic, and political developments in the energy industry. Professor Wheel, welcome to the Alatia Foundation podcast series. Thank you. And um, to begin, I'll ask a straightforward question. What is the difference between green and blue hydrogen? That has to do with the way the hydrogen is produced. Green hydrogen is produced from renewable energy, which uh, would come from uh, wind or photovoltaic energy, then through an electrolysis uh, process. The production process itself doesn't emit any CO2, but then if you look at the plants which are required, um, either the photovoltaic plants or the wind plants and the electrolysis, then in their production process, some CO2 is emitted. So blue hydrogen is produced by steam reforming of natural gas with uh, carbon capture and storage. So the CO2 footprint of that is somewhat higher than green hydrogen, but in both cases much better than grey hydrogen, which is uh, the way hydrogen at the moment is normally produced by steam reforming from natural gas. And is green hydrogen more expensive to produce than blue hydrogen at the moment? What, what are hydrogen's current uses? Yes. Uh, green hydrogen in most parts of the world is more expensive to produce than blue hydrogen, but everything depends upon the cost of renewable power and the cost of natural gas. Over the last two years, both those costs have varied enormously in Europe and the costs are very different uh, in uh, different parts of the world. So, uh, but as a general rule, I would say uh, green hydrogen costs at least 50% more than blue hydrogen. What are the current uses of hydrogen? Hydrogen is used, 50% of it is used in oil refining and 50% of it is used in chemical processes of which uh, ammonia represents uh, the lion's share. In the oil refineries, hydrogen is needed for two reasons. It's needed to desulfurize uh, products, to combine with um, uh, sulfur to produce hydrogen sulfide, and it's also needed for the hydrocrackers, which are used to crack heavy oils to make uh, lighter motor fuels. And a big part of the hydrogen debate is about transportation. And mm. is difficult to transport? And if it is, does that mean that hydrogen will only be used locally to where it's produced, um, such as in the so-called hydrogen hubs? Yes, hydrogen does not like travelling. The molecules are the smallest of any kind, so they leak easily. So pipelines, which already carry natural gas, need repurposing. The pipelines themselves are not the problem. It's the valves and the compressors which need uh, changing. Also, compared with natural gas, the energy density is only 30%. So that means uh, to transport a given quantity of energy in the form of hydrogen compared with natural gas, you need almost three times the amount of steel. So that's the first part of the answer uh, to the question. So then the alternative is to transport it by ship. And there are two possibilities. You can uh, cool it down to minus 250 degrees centigrade. That's almost absolute uh, zero. That's much colder than the transport for liquefied uh, natural gas. There's so far only one uh, ship in the world which transports hydrogen in this way. Therefore, it's much more likely that hydrogen will be transported in the form of ammonia. Uh, and for that, you can use uh, ships which carry uh, LPG, that's uh, propane or butane in liquefied form. And are there any hydrogen hubs active in Europe or the US? And if so, whereabouts are they? Um, 
Well, certainly not for green or blue hydrogen because we hardly got off the ground with either of those uh, products. Um, there are small hubs in the region of uh, oil refineries. So oil refineries, which, as I said, represent 50 percent of current consumption. They produce roughly half of their hydrogen themselves and uh, buy in the other 50 percent. So you've got local sources of hydrogen production. Looking towards the future, the most uh, promising hubs, at least in Europe, would be ports, of which Rotterdam would be the leading example. And uh, that's to be expected. But I think overall progress with the rollout of hydrogen will be quite slow. Right. And we touched on cost very briefly, but if we can return to it, how much does it cost um, to produce blue and green hydrogen today? And, and how do these costs compare to producing natural gas and coal? Yes, that, if I may say so, is a very open ended question, because with respect to green hydrogen, uh, you've got the first question, what are the full costs of producing uh, electricity from renewables. Then you've got the second question. If it costs me 80 euros a megawatt hour, but the wholesale market is paying 120 euros a megawatt hour, then if I'm producing uh, renewable power, I would rather sell it to the wholesale market. So arguably that should be uh, the price. The price of natural gas has varied enormously over the last two years. But what I've done is I've looked at the uh, forward curves for electricity and gas prices. And then just to give you ballpark figures, and please bear in mind, these are no more than ballpark figures. Green hydrogen would be about 180 euros a megawatt hour. Blue hydrogen, 85. Natural gas, 40. And coal, 17. So you see there's a very big range. And does that mean or, you know, how does that relate to the likeliness that hydrogen will then replace natural gas in, in its main markets like electricity generation and domestic industrial space heating? We've heard that there are some trials being done. And um, do you know how these are progressing? Mm. Um, the main applications for new forms of hydrogen would not be so much in those markets, but firstly, as far as possible, replacing grey hydrogen in refineries, because there you've got a quick uh, win. You don't need uh, new plants to use the refinery. Um, with respect to replacing natural gas uh, for electricity generation, the round trip efficiency is very poor. It's between 35 and 40 percent. So it means if I produce a megawatt hour of uh, renewable electricity converted to hydrogen and then back to electricity, I only get about 0.3 of a uh, megawatt hour in return. So it's probably better to overdimension renewables plant. With respect to domestic and industrial space heating, I think we're quite a long way from that. What is envisaged is that up to 20 percent of hydrogen could be blended into uh, the natural gas, which is uh, delivered during uh, through the existing pipelines, because you can do that without having to change the burners which are used for natural gas. When you go beyond that, then you have to replace um, you know, burners, you need new boilers and so on. So uh, it's all round uh, more expensive. Uh, the trials are very limited and I don't think they're showing anything particularly unexpected. Right, that's interesting. I mean, um, a big part of this as well is that economies of scale have been a critical factor in reducing costs in many markets and for many commodities. Do you think the same thing will apply to hydrogen? Will will markets develop so that demand for hydrogen will bring forward um, cheaper supply? Yes and no. Uh, <laughs> the, the big hope is that when the learning curve for electrolyzers kicks in, that in the same way that it's worked a treat for the specific costs of uh, PV plant and originally wind, that the cost will come down quite a lot. We haven't even begun 
on that uh, journey. On the other hand, the cost of steel has gone up uh, quite a lot. The cost of other uh, critical materials has gone up. There's a shortage of workers. And another factor is the demand for clean electricity, not just for hydrogen, but for other uh, applications will become extremely tight. So this comes back to what I was saying uh, earlier. It's not so much the cost of renewables which will count in the production cost of hydrogen, but its opportunity cost or its value in other markets. So taking those two factors together, uh, I'm not optimistic that uh, in Europe, at any rate, the cost of hydrogen uh, will come down. Mm. So then I suppose uh, a crucial question is how likely it is um, that hydrogen um, could take fossil fuels place in the so-called hard to abate industries like iron, uh, steel and concrete production, uh, considering these kind of high temperatures, which are um, only yeah. achievable with coal or natural gas. Well, I can tell you that the steel industry in Germany in particular is trying extremely hard and it's got financial support for the plants that it needs, but it doesn't know yet where it's going to get its hydrogen uh, from. Uh, the best uh, prospect, at least for Northwest Europe, is probably for blue hydrogen from Norway, but that requires a new pipeline to be built. And that's not something that's going to happen overnight. So it's really a race against time to see how much hydrogen in the form of hydrogen rather than ammonia could be made available or brought to Europe or to Northwest Europe. Uh, in the time required. There's one point that's very important to make. Hydrogen doesn't make good use of renewable energy. If I've got renewable energy, there are much better things that I can do with it, such as replacing uh, coal and nuclear plants, which are due to be closed, using it for electric cars, using it for heat pumps. So except probably in Iberia, it's simply not logical to be producing hydrogen from electrolyzers. There are a lot of projects, but I've no great hopes that they're going to come to fruition. And would that whole process be helped sort of with new technical processes that are required to use hydrogen in these hard to abate industries? Well, the new processes are essential and they're very expensive. That applies uh, especially to steel, uh, Tussum Krupp recently have made an investment or in process of making an investment costing some uh, 2 billion euros. They've had uh, some significant financial support uh, for that. Uh, the cost of doing the same in the ammonia industry is very high, and at least in Germany, it's not expected that that will begin until the uh, 2030s. So these new plants aren't help. They're absolutely essential. And Again, on, on, on transport, now I know we touched on it very briefly um, and, and, you know, uh, transporting as a, a ammonia, but I think um, if, if we can come back to it very briefly, um, if hydrogen is, is difficult and expensive to transport, as, as you mentioned, and um, how will it be uh, transported to energy poor but industrialised countries? Um, will ammonia or methanol be used as a transport medium? And, and could that strategy cause the, a big increase in, in costs? I think the cheaper sources of hydrogen will act as magnets for energy intensive uh, industry. Uh, I keep coming back to Germany, which is not only the country where I live, but it's got uh, a very large energy intensive uh, sector. One is uh, seeing deindustrialization that the energy intensive uh, companies, when they need to build a new plant, they're thinking of building it rather in other countries, uh, starting with the United States. Um, what is technically possible is to import hydrogen in the form of ammonia and then to recrack it back to hydrogen. But the technology isn't yet uh, proven and the energy losses are considerable. Uh, so, in short, to have significant quantities of hydrogen available in Europe and other industrialised countries will be very expensive. And, and on the expense um, issue, 
Uh, are there any exciting technologies or, or, or process developments on the horizon um, that you know of that may reduce the cost of hydrogen significantly? Um, Evonik, the German chemicals company, has the aim uh, with a new technology to reduce the capital cost of electrolyzers by about 30% and to improve the efficiency from the current level of around about 65%, um, maybe to 75% or, or thereabout. But we have to wait for that to be proven. Fantastic. Thank you so much for your time. And to, to, to conclude this fascinating discussion, Professor Wheel, I have one last question for you. Are you hopeful that climate change targets of 1.5 or 2 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels can be achieved by 2050? No, unfortunately, I'm not at all hopeful because the challenges are, are far too great. And as one's trying to move uh, fast forward in Europe, I'm just uh, seeing uh, how many obstacles there are. Voters aren't willing to make the necessary fact um, their sacrifices and to achieve these goals would require single mindedness at a global level. And with unfortunately wars, ref refugee crisis and an increased global uh, divide, I just can't see that happening. Well, a slightly, uh, <laughs> uh, that it's a, it's a, it's a, you know, a difficult uh, discussion, isn't it? And, and and are you saying then that maybe the the um the weight of it falls on to to individuals or, or you know what is the um is is there a, a positive spin there? Um, many of the right measures are being applied, but as we try to apply them we see just how difficult they are in terms of how much they cost, how challenging the technology is, uh, getting uh, permits. And uh, overall, I have to say at a global level, the will isn't great enough to succeed at the moment. And that's what needs changing. OK, thank you so much, Professor Graham Wheel, for your expertise on this pertinent topic um, and I'm sure our listeners learned a great deal. I certainly learned a great deal from your very thoughtful answers and um, the foundation very much looks forward to continuing this conversation uh, with you in the future. Thank you very much. You're very welcome.